Welcome to the Rural Report, a program that enlists experts to provide Kansas farmers and ranchers with the latest information about how COVID-19 is affecting agriculture. Rural Report is a special production of Kansas Farm Bureau in partnership with KFRM's Dwayne Taves and WIBW's Greg Coggy. Our program this week, uh, looking at uh, the ethanol industry, and certainly it's been under duress uh, for a number of weeks now, and there are a fair number of reasons why that's taking place. Today, joining us, Greg Krissick, CEO of Kansas Corn Growers Association, and Derek Piney, General Manager of Western Plains Energy in Oakley, Kansas. Uh, gentlemen, uh, appreciate your time is spent with us on the program today. We're going to start things off and jump right into it. Uh, Derek, can you give us a, an overview of where ethanol production is, uh, where it was before the crisis, uh, and, and where it's at today for your operation and, and maybe a bigger picture look at it as well? Sure, and thanks for having me on, Dwayne. Uh, you know, in Kansas, uh, with the latest plant that came online last summer, uh, Kansas ethanol has can produce about 600 million gallons per year of ethanol. In regard to kind of the current status of things, uh, maybe I should back up just a little bit and give a, a little bit of a history of how we got to uh, this COVID situation, where we're at. You know, prior to the situation, the industry has actually been under financial pressure really since the summer 2018, mainly due to the oversupply of ethanol into the marketplace. Margins during that time were hovering kind of around break-even levels. Sometimes they're a little above, sometimes a little below. And then actually in early March of this year, we had a situation where OPEC and Russia were unable to come to agreement on the crude oil production rate. And OPEC decided to increase production and drive the price of crude oil down from, say, $50 a barrel into the low $20 uh, range per barrel. And with crude oil pricing drop, that typically pushes down gasoline pricing, which also pushes down ethanol pricing. So if we're already in a spring position, the OPEC, uh, decision only worsened our margin structure and pushed most Kansas ethanol plants down below break even. And then, of course, the COVID situation uh, started to really affect our industry there in the latter part of March as we started to see states implement these stay at home orders, including Kansas's order uh, there at the end of March. So, all these stay at home orders have had a really quick and dramatic impact on gasoline demand. As a country, we saw gas demand drop by about 50% from normal, uh, you know, kind of at the lowest point of gasoline demand. And all of that happened within two to three, maybe four weeks of time. And so then if gas demand drops, ethanol again, demand also has to drop proportionally. So from our perspective, it felt like almost overnight ethanol demand tightened up. And we were all scrambling to react and, and lower overall production. It was kind of this perfect storm against ethanol. Uh, we were at break-even margins or probably less than that prior to the virus situation. Uh, the COVID uh, virus shows up, pushes margins lower, drives up demand, even to the point where there just was nowhere to take ethanol, even if, you know, for any price. So today in Kansas, we have two plants that are, are shut down or halted production. And then the rest of the plant, um, we've all slowed production to various rates or various degrees. And the degree to which we slowed really is driven by the specific markets that those plants supply ethanol into. For our company, we reduced rates down uh, to about half of our normal rate. And overall, I think the Kansas ethanol production uh, has reduced probably in that 40 to 50% range uh, from kind of normal for the industry. Turning to a corn grower's perspective, uh, Greg Krissick, uh, CEO of Kansas Corn Growers. Uh, ethanol production, it takes a significant amount of Kansas corn uh, crop each year. Uh, what is the percentage and, and how much slowing of that production and reduced uh, ethanol uh, production will reduce demand for, for Kansas corn and, and impacting Kansas corn growers? And, and are there other factors uh, that are impacting corn price as well? Sure, Dwayne, thanks uh, as well for having me part of the conversation today. You know, nationally, um, frequently the uh, amount of corn, percentage of corn used uh, directed to the ethanol industry is um, anywhere between 35 and 40 percent. But in Kansas, uh, we've had, you know, a couple, couple really good years, especially 2019, 
So we've actually seen our percentage going to ethanol drop a bit. We've been more in the 25% of our total production um, has been supplying that uh, 550 to 600 million gallons that uh, uh, Derek was talking about. And, of course, um, when uh, that corn is processed in the ethanol plant, you still got about a third of the bushel coming out as the high protein, high quality, high protein uh, feed distillers grains. So, very important market for us. Um, you know, we operate on three markets: uh, uh, direct to livestock, the ethanol, and then um, more and more exports. Um, and as we've grown our crop in Kansas, just from a numbers percentage, we've had a higher percentage leaving the state and even being exported, but. Ethanol still right in that 25% range in Kansas for for our corn production. Obviously, uh, we're coming out of a tough time uh, for growers. Uh, the trade, uh, global trade, had been slowed to, to a, a drastic degree with uh, our issues with China. We get a phase one agreement signed. Uh, looks like things are going to take off, and then we see this drastic, rapid reduction in in ethanol and fuel usage worldwide, but uh, in in Kansas and, and nationally here in the U.S. as well, dropping that ethanol demand for corn. Do you see that playing out? Uh, do we have a chance before the next corn crop gets here in the fall? Well, Dwayne, I'd certainly say volatility in all these markets has kind of become the watchword. Um, we, you know, couldn't have expected what was going to happen with gasoline demand that Derek was describing both from the um, Russia-Saudi Arabia spat, as well as then um, the huge impacts from COVID. So uh, yet it is springtime, and we see the planters rolling across the state, actually across the country. For the most part, it looks like this spring compared to last spring is a very positive planting environment so far. Um, And as most of the producers know, it's been uh, estimated that somewhere between 95 to 97 million uh, acres of corn are going to get planted. Kansas is not tremendously different in, in its relationship there. We're uh, scheduled a little bit down, uh, about 100,000 acres down from last year. Again, the record year that we had 800 million bushels produced in Kansas. And um, planting is proceeding fairly well at this point. So um, optimism because they're being able to plant, but those international markets and the ethanol market and even some challenges on the livestock side certainly has uh, been reflected in what's been happening in the corn market. Derek, uh, we've seen recently, uh, a couple of weeks ago, what can happen when you run out of oil storage uh, with prices actually going negative on the board and uh, an opportunity to, to pay someone to take a product from you seems absurd. Ethanol, do they have the same issues uh, as far as uh, these plants, if they continue to roll, but we don't get those gasoline markets uh, rolling again to where we can get at least 10% of that ethanol moved out? Is there a storage issue that we need to be concerned about for ethanol? Yes, yeah, so I'd say the, uh, the storage situation for ethanol is similar to oil. You know, we, we obviously don't have a strategic reserve or something like that, but the majority of ethanol storage probably isn't actually in tank space. However, I would say every tank that's out there is probably completely full with ethanol, just as it is with crude oil and just as it is with gasoline. There's also a huge volume of storage that's sitting on rail cars today. And, it, you know, as, as the gas demand went way down, the ethanol demand went way down, that was the natural buffer was to put it on rail cars. Now, the, the good news is we had seen inventories get up over 50 days worth of supply. Normal is more like 20 to 25 days. The report out today, uh, we've come down quite a bit the last couple of weeks uh, off of that inventory number. And we're also starting to see gasoline pick up. I mentioned earlier that gasoline at its low got down to 50%. Today's number shows that at, at about 70% of normal. So we've seen some pickup uh, in gas demand. Our plant, we've sped up a little bit uh, already or late last week from 50%. We've moved up a little bit. Uh, so I'm starting to feel like we've, we found the bottom of gas demand, the bottom of ethanol demand. Things are turning around. It's going to be slow, though. We have a massive inventory issue out there. We need to work down or work off some of that inventory before we really see uh, any real incentive come back to an ethanol production facility to to 
really ramp up production uh, too far or too fast. Greg, uh, obviously, uh, we talk about uh, the corn crop and storage. Uh, last year's crop was already stored. Uh, we haven't used all of it yet. Hopefully, we have a good crop coming this fall. Do we see storage concerns from a producer's perspective, or do we have enough flat and open storage to take care of it? And along with that, what are some of the price concerns with uh, the market in a local way uh, if those ethanol plants aren't back up and running at 100%, what might producers expect this fall? Sure. Thanks, Dwayne. Got a lot to chew on in that question. Um, so, you know, I, it's my perspective that um, we in Kansas have been fairly used to managing through uh, these types of uh, sizes of crops. Um, of course, you know, we'll always wonder if we have a good-sized wheat crop and then the corn crop behind it. Um, what that might mean if there's lower demand out there. But generally speaking, um, my feedback from the grain handling industry and the um, on-farm storage that also supplies some of the ethanol plants and their own increases in, in handling is that we do have the mechanisms to uh, handle the, uh, the corn crop and the larger corn crop, including um, the type of outside on-the-ground um, storage systems that have been put in place over the last uh, several years. You know, um, uh, typically a, a bushel of corn is going to uh, help uh, Derek at his ethanol plant produce 2.85, 2.9 gallons uh, of ethanol. So when you see that ethanol demand dropping, certainly see the demand dropping on the corn side as well. Uh, and we're in the middle of, or getting towards the end of the marketing year, kind of in the middle towards the latter half. Um, nationally, they've said, you know, 375 million bushel uh, demand drop, um, which I think is probably going to increase. And depending on which market, part of the year you're counting, you know, within this April to August time frame, that could be at least a 17% decline in demand. But over the entire market year, about a, a 7%. So I think I think we're preparing on how to manage and handle the quantities if we get another good crop in there. Obviously, as I mentioned, there have been um, some other demand uh, that Kansas corn has been also going to, um, and exports even to Mexico have generally you know, come back and stayed fairly strong. So um, I think we'll be able to manage the quantity of the crop uh, as, it, uh, as it gets closer to harvest. As far as uh, pricing, obviously those growers that are near ethanol plants have looked at a chance to get an improved basis uh, with that demand nearby. Uh, is there concern about what that may look like this fall? Well, sure. Um, you know, going into um, this year, you know, I think there was some some optimism that corn would be you know, hanging out around that nice uh, uh, $4 mark or a little bit over. Um, and then uh, pretty quickly it started coming down um, uh, and is off, you know, clearly 15 to uh, probably even a little bit more percent um, on that. Um, actually been involved in some national meetings here within the last week. And I know uh, some of my uh, counterparts uh, back in the I state, Illinois especially, uh, are under, you know, certainly talking about under the $3 mark um, and 280 and concerned about that. So there has been a dramatic impact. Um, all the way around. Part of it's tied to ethanol, um, but in some areas uh, in those ice states too, very much tied to what's going on with uh, livestock processing as well. Obviously, there's been a tremendous amount of turmoil in the livestock industry, and we won't delve into all of that to, from the production and packing and processing side, but specifically how each of your industries that you work within uh, within the, the parameters that you work with the livestock industry. Derek, uh, as an ethanol plant, uh, obviously you've got a co-product in distillers uh, that you're producing. A uh, reduced amount of that that you're providing to the livestock industry, which in one regard might be good if there's reduced demand. But the flip side is if they're wanting that product, it's become very favorable in livestock rations. Uh, how has that, uh, that transaction been going and the folks that you work with directly? Yeah, good, good question, Dwayne. And I would say, you know, so far with, um, you know, as we reduced rate, we actually had a great demand uh, for distillers. As the feedlot or the, you know, the feeders weren't really uh, affected quite yet by this virus situation. You know, as we marched forward, though, the hot spot with the virus, especially in Kansas, has been around these packing plants and processing plants. 
So that's starting to now have an effect on the, the feedlot. As we're starting to ramp up our production, we have a couple issues that we're thinking about uh, in relation to our distillers front. One is a lot of those um, feedlots had to change their rations as the availability of distillers uh, was greatly reduced. So they switched to other feedstuffs. And as we we come back with uh, more distillers as we've raised our rate, you know, I think feedlot uh, managers are going to be a little bit careful to want to switch back to us. So I'm expecting that's going to be a little bit of a slow process getting back in until they gain the confidence that demand for our product is there and that we're, we'll be able to continually supply the distillers as we go forward. And then this issue around the, the processing plants and kind of the backing up the inventory into the feedlots, I'm not sure how that's going to hit us. We haven't seen it yet, uh, but I expect both of those issues to be something we should be thinking about here going forward. Greg, as far as corn growers, uh, they've always been tremendous supporters of the livestock industry and understanding that a, a fair portion of the crop uh, goes directly to livestock feeding. Uh, we've heard some of the discussion points, particularly in the swine industry. It's affecting the cattle and poultry industries as well. Do we see a, a demand drop uh, for animal feeds and what that might play out uh, for corn's price? You know, Dwayne, I, I think we, we have to say yes, that we will see that impact um, into uh, uh, fewer livestock going through the going through the system for now until some of the processing and, and the workforce issues for the processors um, can be uh, can be moderated as we go. I will point out, you know, uh, on the export side, um, you know, we're supporters of both Grains Council and uh, U.S. Meat Export Federation. Grains Council has been working on ethanol exports around the world. Um, and as the economy starts to come back after this, um, we still have uh, hopes that while we've seen a dip in ethanol exports, that we'll see them start to um, pick up again. Um, also, uh, on the distillers, you know, uh, there's probably been some challenges in some markets where distillers is no longer um, as cost uh, competitive as it might have been just because of shorter supplies and high, you know, the high demand for what is being produced here in, in the U.S. On, on the MEF side or, and on the meat export side, I guess you know, I, I still see and understand from uh, uh, reports we've even just gotten within the last couple of days uh, that protein demand around the world is still very, very strong and uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, especially into the Asian markets. And so while it may not be as uh, big a demand as we had hoped um, in a corn of all form in protein, um, it does appear there's still going to be growth year over year, this year over last, um, in those exports uh, around the meat products. So as long as we can get through the processing issues that are created by the virus that's, uh, and the workforce, um, we need to keep that, uh, keep focused on that intensely. Quick final question for both of you then, Derek. I'll have you lead it off. You kind of referenced it. It appears that maybe we've found the bottom. What does the path back to normal look like for the ethanol industry from here? You know, Dwayne, I'm not really sure what normal is anymore or what it's going to look like as we go forward. But a couple key things that we're focusing on is um, as fuel demand has started to pick up and everyone's excited that we're maybe headed in the right direction and increased our production rate, I think we need to be really careful to make sure that we find a good balance between supply and demand as things change over the next uh, few weeks and months. Our margins today are still negative, uh, even though we've increased rate, and we just need to make sure that we don't ramp up too fast and put additional pressure on the margin. The second thing um, I think, and probably more importantly, that we need to focus on is as, as the uh, COVID situation kind of encroached on our day-to-day -day world. We instituted several health and safety uh, protocols at our facility uh, really to kind of prevent or protect our employees' health and their family's health, and also to protect our business against having to uh, do 14-day quarantines. And I think we want to be really thoughtful on how we approach uh, relaxing those protocols. As the state, the state of Kansas, you know, has entered phase one of the reopening program, and then we'll march through phase two and three, and then ultimately the reopen phase. Uh, we want to be careful and probably very thoughtful around how we do that and just make sure we don't let our guard down. You know, the last thing we want to do is, is have a bunch of 14-day quarantine issues 
that impact our production and, and force us to shut down because we don't have the staffing available to operate the plant. And and so we're, we'll probably you know sit with the same protocols for at least another month or so, and uh, you know approach things pretty carefully uh, beyond that. Greg, for corn growers, uh, the path back to normal there. Most farmers and ranchers, uh, things haven't changed a whole lot uh, for their systems outside of maybe some safety precautions. You know, Dwayne, I know a number of our leaders, producers have said, you know, we they've had the privilege of really kind of continuing to do what they normally would do. But we have focused with them on, and National Corn has provided some tools. We have uh, a wide variety of uh, things on our website that we have conveyed uh, then through emails and newsletters to our members about that. Uh, and, and echoing what Derek was saying about safety uh, in their farming operations, um, because again, there's not a tremendous amount of backup human resource for any of the small operations. And if somebody did need to be quarantined, or or hopefully you know not not deal with the virus directly, but had to be quarantined, you know, that's going to have a huge impact on that operation at key times, like planting or when it comes to harvest, things like that. So we're really trying to help them focus on that, coming back to normal, you know, we'll see. Again, I'll, I'll go with the volatility worth watchword and operations preparing, you know, plans so that a continuity of operation and understanding, you know, what they need to do to protect their operations in the marketplace with risk management will be very, very key in a time of volatility that I see happening for the next um, six to 12 months for sure. Our thanks to Derek Piney, General Manager of Western Plains Energy in Oakley, Kansas, and Greg Kresick, CEO of Kansas Corn Growers Association, joining us on Rural Report, the program brought to you by Kansas Farm Bureau, KFRM, and WIBW. Have a great day.